through our journal, Historic Gardens Review, which some of you know, and there are copies for everybody who doesn't know it later. Um, through the Historic Gardens Review, which is published twice a year and distributed worldwide, we give publicity to gardens that have been restored. We draw attention to gardens that are in a bad state and need restoring, and we campaign for gardens that are threatened by development or ecological problems. Can everybody hear me before I start the slides? We also explore questions of management. For instance, we had an article by the owner of Vola Vicomte on how he had decided to employ outside contractors to do most of the work in his garden. And then a reply from the garden team at the Tuileries saying that they, how they believed it was much better to employ gardeners directly. That's Vaux. And this is the Tuileries. I thought it might amuse you to be reminded of what the Tuileries gardens used to look like. Um, this was taken in 1969. We also once had a very practical article with a lot of input from National Trust staff about how to cope when a garden has so many visitors that the grass gets ruined in places. The review aims to present serious information in an accessible and well-illustrated fashion. I hope lots of you will want to subscribe to it and also send us information about gardens you know. The HGF also has an internet site but even with all the benefits of modern technology, we believe the printed word is still the best way of sharing information. We can also campaign for individual gardens through lobbying the powers that be when requested and offering informal advice, in the UK at least, on planning law. For instance, we recently helped Borton Park in its current fight against gravel extraction. And you'd had a slide of that, but the post let me down this morning. We interpret the idea of historic in the widest possible way, as you will see, and we try to cover all aspects of the subject, researching a garden's history, including doing the archaeology, restoring it properly, maintaining it once it is restored, even the pleasures and pitfalls of opening it to the public. Whoops, we've lost one. Um, we don't own gardens, we don't restore gardens ourselves, and we don't give grants for restoration. Though we do give a prize for good restoration, so let me start with that. Last year, the Historic Gardens Foundation had the idea of creating this prize to encourage serious research and proper garden restoration. Eventually, we intend this prize to be Europe and even worldwide, but it seems sensible to make the scope smaller to start with. After discussions with La Demeure Historique, the French Private Owners Association, who incidentally I find far more clued up about their gardens than the English HHA, after what you were saying, Ted, this morning. Um, after discussions with La Demeure Historique, we decided that initially the prize would be offered for the restoration of a built element in a French garden. This includes garden buildings such as follies, greenhouses or orangeries, and structural elements such as staircases and balustrades, or even the surface of alleys, though not the trees. Statuary is included, but not fountains. The restoration has to be completed and the work done within the previous three years, and the prize offered is two and a half thousand pounds. The garden must be open to the public, and its owners have to be members either of La Demeure Historique, who kindly undertake the administration of the prize, or of the Historic Gardens Foundation. Applicants are asked to submit dossiers, including before and after photographs and slides. Last year, we awarded the prize to the Chateau of Kerlevenon, near Sarzo in Brittany. This is what you can see here. For the restoration of its Chinese pavilion. Kerlevenon has a fascinating, if not completely clear, history. In 1784, the owner, the Marquis de Gouvelot, commissioned a Norman architect, J.F. Jouan, to replace his medieval manor house with a larger, more modern chateau. Joanne was also asked to lay out gardens round the house. Presumably with his patron's approval, he decided on a somewhat old-fashioned formal design with terraces and parterres. The plans survive, but it is not certain they were actually implemented. About 40 years ago, when a tennis court was made on the main axis of the house, oh dear, a flight of steps was found, so there's a case for some archeology span to be done. 
In a gesture to something more fashionable at the time, Joanne also designed various small buildings to be placed in a less formal landscape further from the house. Two of these, the Chinese Pavilion and the Temple d'Amour, were built just before the revolution broke out in 1789. As you know, many small Chinese-style buildings and bridges were built in France at appropriate points in Parc à l'Anglaise. Few, however, survive, and the pavilion at Caire Levenon is unique in Brittany, another reason why it was awarded the HGF prize. The prize winner was chosen by a jury who studied dossiers and photographs, like this one. That's the before picture, explaining what had been done. And there's the after. Sent in by the owners of various properties, explaining what's been done and how and why. As it was impossible to visit all the sites, we decided it was more fair to visit none of them. The jury gave particular weight to the fact that at Kerr Levenon, very adequate research seemed to have been done into the history of the pavilion, both its original state and what had happened to it since. Unfortunately, when my husband and I actually visited Kelevenon recently, we discovered that the paint was already peeling off the outside walls of the Chinese pavilion. You can see at the bottom there. And there. And off the columns. In effect, the work we had rewarded had not been done as well as we had believed. The reason seems to be a breakdown of communication between an owner who believes he has the sole right to decide what is done on his own property and an architect on chef who was perhaps not sufficiently tactful in the suggestions he made. This I know is a common problem and I have sympathy with both sides. Indeed, I would like to think that the HGF can help prevent such conflicts by giving information freely to everyone concerned. It should be a delight, not a burden, to own a historic park or garden and equally a pleasure, not a battle, to play a role in its restoration or management. When we first started visiting gardens in France, 30 odd years ago, the standard of maintenance was nothing like as good as it is today. Gardens that had been in a marvellous state before the war had not recovered from damage caused at that time or from the economic problems that succeeded. Even Villandry had fallen into a state where it gave pleasure neither to its owners the grandparents of Henri Carvalho, who's going to speak this afternoon, nor to the public who paid to visit it. Will it focus? Thank you. This is Villandry in 1964. You can see the lights used at the bottom for the Sans et Lumière, which are no there, longer there. What happened in those days was that they took your ticket money, charged you extra if you wanted to take photographs, and then marched you briskly on a guided tour around the upper terraces only. You were not allowed to walk round the potager, admiring the flowers and vegetables at your leisure. And what was worse was that the beds were as full of weeds as they were of flowers or vegetables. While in the Jardin d'Amour, most of the beds had no flowers at all. And this in August. We felt very cheated. And although we have a house not far away, it was many years before we went back by which time Henri's parents had taken over, a great transformation had taken place, not just in the standard of maintenance, but in the quality of the way visitors are received. The ideal garden should be well maintained and efficiently run and have a welcoming atmosphere if it's open to the public, which is why you're looking at this rather peculiar slide. It shows the outside of a garden called Rosambo, one of the oldest in Brittany long after the time it was meant to open to the public. Quite a crowd had collected, waiting for someone to let us in, and eventually we sent this small boy over the wall to try to find the guardian. While my respectable lawyer husband, in the Panama hat, and a newfound friend tried to pick the lock of the gate. <laughs> So if you do open your garden to the public, even if only for a single day under the Yellow Book scheme, or in Juin, Mois des Jardins, or if you work in or are connected with a garden that is open, you should genuinely make visitors welcome and not act as though you're doing them a favour by taking their money. 
Of course, not all gardens do open to the public. Many of the best are private, but I would suggest that some of these can still be a matter of public concern. One example is the garden you're looking at now. It is called Le Coudre Montpensier, and is near Chinon, about half an hour's drive from Villandry. In fact, there is a Villandry connection, as Dr. Carvalho, about whom Henri will speak to you this afternoon, who created Villandry, was a friend of the owner of Le Coudre Montpensier, Pierre-Georges Latécoère, who was famous in his time as an industrialist, particularly a plane maker, and amongst other things, he was the employer of Saint-Exupéry as a pilot. Latécoère bought Le Coudre et Montpensier in 1930 as a wedding present for his wife and spent a fortune restoring the 15th century chateau. With his friend Dr. Carvalho as advisor and a professional garden designer, Henri Laprade, in day-to-day -day charge of the massive, <coughs> massive project, he created a garden based on three existing levels of 18th century terraces, which you can just see there. From contemporary descriptions, we know it was a marvel, filled with 100,000 bedding plants and looking like a medieval illustration, such as those in the Très Richard of the Duc de Berry. Such a colourful effect would, of course, have been unknown in a medieval garden. It was the idea of an illuminated miniature that Latécoère, a collector of manuscripts, was after. Unfortunately, Madame Latécoère didn't like her splendid wedding present and lived there for only one week. <laughs> During the war, the chateau was requisitioned, first by the French and later by the Germans. Then it became a colony de vacances for children from Paris and was later rented as a home for mentally handicapped children, a quite inappropriate use. The gardens became overgrown and the walls and terraces started to crumble. The photographs you've been looking at were taken in 1991 when a small association of which I am a member was set up to try to save it. These are from 1992. You can see the deterioration of the Charmy. And these are from 93. You can see how the deterioration is continuing. The handicapped children have now moved out of the chateau, but our association has been unable to persuade the owner, who collected the rent from them all those years, either to take an interest in restoring the property or to sell it to someone who might look after it better. That owner is no longer the Latécoère family, who sold Le Coudre Montpensier many years ago. That owner is the city of Paris, La Ville de Paris. It is not for me, an outsider, to comment on the political reasons which lead an organisation with considerable resources at its disposal to allow part of its national heritage, our European heritage, to disappear. But I do regret that there are no laws in France or in England which properly protect historic gardens. And when official bodies fail to protect their own properties, it makes it more difficult to reproach a private owner who neglects a historic garden which he or she may not have the means to maintain. Let me show you two gardens in the south of France which need attention and where private owners are not as committed as perhaps they might be to a careful restoration. The first is the Villa Noailles at Grasse, created by the Vicomte de Noailles, who made the garden in the 1940s and 50s. Not only is it a lovely garden, once full of rare and beautiful plants, but it is historically important as a very late example of the many fine gardens created in the south of France, often by English and Americans, at the end of the 19th and in the early 20th centuries. Most were made with the particular intention of growing all the extraordinary new plants that were suitable for the Mediterranean climate. But a further interest of the Villa Noailles at Grasse is that the Vicomte is one of the first people seriously to study the plants that grow well in a Mediterranean climate. After the death of the Vicomte, the garden was neglected for a while, but his grandson, who inherited it, made a good start on a restoration project. Here are Jane Harvey and Bruno Goris actually working on the, um, one of the terraces. 
Alas, the owner seems to have lost interest, and visitors, I believe, are no longer allowed, and he refuses to discuss the garden's future with me or, I understand, with other people, even his friends. Further along the Côte d'Azur is Les Colombières, where the extraordinary garden created by Ferdinand Bach had fallen into considerable decay by the time I took these photos in 1992. An eccentric house and a complicated problem of succession meant that the property was not easy to sell. But eventually a new owner was found. There's one more view of the dilapidation. I wrote to her earlier this year and she replied that she was not very interested in historic gardens. I find this sad and shocking and feel no qualms about saying so as she's English. The Historic Gardens Foundation would like the owners of historic gardens to feel that they are in, a, in possession of a wonderful gift which can give them great pleasure and we are saddened that so many feel overwhelmed by what they have bought or inherited. Some, of course, manage very well. The pagoda at Chanteloup, for instance, designed by the architect Camus for the Duc de Choiseul, was saved by the owners, Monsieur and Madame André, working with an association of friends. And even though, even though the park has long disappeared, the pagoda remains as a tribute to their hard work and determination. The owners of Canon in Normandy have also put in an enormous amount of effort over the years, res restoring the walled gardens known as the Chartreuse. This is before the restoration. And more recently, Laton in maine loire has seen the result of careful research and investment, much of it European money. This is the restored shooting hideout in the park. And this is the bridge across the canal before work began. I mentioned the matter of inheritance and it's already been brought up um, in the questions. Uh, it seems to be the bane of every French family's life. In some ways, France has one of the most owner-friendly tax regimes in Europe in that no death duties are payable if the property is open to the public for a fairly limited number of days a year. But the complications in terms of the need to divide it between all the owner's children make an easy transfer between generations more complicated than it need be. In the UK, the owner normally has the freedom to leave his or her garden to anyone, inside or outside the family. But this is not necessarily a good thing either. And the HGF is not campaigning for any European harmonisation of the tax on succession. But we bear such problems in mind as a factor in the continuing well-being of privately owned gardens. Just as fiscal policy at a local level affects the maintenance of public parks and gardens. However, we are campaigning for tax reform in the matter of a remission of VAT on the materials needed for garden restoration. The burden of VAT on repairs to historic buildings has been well aired, and there is a good chance there will be some relaxation of the rules. But many people are unaware that the trees and plants needed to restore a garden is just as subject to VAT as the stone and mortar needed to restore a building. It adds, I think, 8% in France and 17.5% in the UK, and it's a very unfair burden. Now, many of the slides you've seen have been of privately owned gardens, but I want to emphasise that the HGF also exists to support gardens that are state or municipally owned. In London, for instance, we worked on this small garden owned by the London Borough of Southwark, one of the poorest areas in London, and one where green spaces are at a premium. The lack of an adequate budget meant that its Victorian detail had been buried and forgotten under easy-to-maintain asphalt and grass. But research produced evidence that local people had once had a bandstand, a two-storey pavilion, which you can just see the outside lines of on the left, two-storey pavilion and a pond with a little bridge to enjoy, as well as elaborately planted flower beds. Our local historian also discovered that the original garden had been commissioned by Octavia Hill, famous as one of the founders of the National Trust. Red Cross Garden is currently applying for lottery funding for a full restoration to its Victorian splendour. And the HGF is proud that by giving a small grant to students from Greenwich University, we set the ball rolling and enabled the preliminary survey of the garden to be done. This was the first but necessary step towards the restoration plan. And at that point, the National Trust was refusing to take any interest in the project, although, of course, they've now jumped on the bandwagon. 
But back to France. I said that the Historic Gardens Foundation looks at historic gardens in the widest possible sense. Cairdolo, for instance, is one of the greatest gardens, not just in France, but in Europe, for the quality of its design and plantings. And although not begun until 1965, can certainly be regarded as part of our garden heritage. The remit of the HGF also specifically includes new gardens created in a historic context, such as that designed by Penelope Hobhouse at Walmart. Whoops, sorry, that's another one of Cairdolo. And another one of Cairdolo. And this is the one designed by Penelope Hobhouse at Walmart Castle in Kent. It was not easy to complement the low mass of the castle battlements, but even in its first year, the garden had a certain maturity and an air of having always been settled in just that spot. In France, Erignac in the Dordogne is an example of a garden that became an instant classic. It was made in the 1960s by Gilles Semaridas de Puzol de Lille, who was born in the house. Yes, the house in 1909, and I believe he's still alive. I admire it very much and hope it survives. But where gardens have been created by a member of the family which actually lives in the house, we must be careful not to limit his or her scope to change their creation. Not just the details of the planting, but the whole structure if they wish. Eurignac was listed in 1986. And if we list gardens too quickly, we risk their becoming rigid and stuck in amber. Now let me give you an example of something which the HGF is interested in, but which might not obviously appear of horticultural value or worth preserving. The walls at Tomery near Fontainebleau, which I consider just as much a part of the horticultural heritage as the more famous park which lies beside them, were built in the 18th and 19th centuries to facilitate the ripening of a dessert grape, the Chasselas Doré de Fontainebleau. In those days, with no refrigeration, each bunch was preserved with its stalk in water until it could be transported to Paris and sold out of season for a vast profit. It was a real industry and almost every house in the village was involved in the trade. Placed end to end, the parallel rows of south facing walls would have stretched for 350 kilometres. In this century, the invention of refrigeration and of easy communication with Africa and the Far East meant that not only are grapes available almost all the year round, but that far more exotic fruits can be imported to tempt the palates of Parisian gourmets. So the people of Tomeri started pulling down the walls to make space in their gardens. Those that survive are almost invisible from the roads that run through the village, but make a marvellous sight from the air. Just in time, some of the walls and one of the tracks along which carts pass to collect the fruit have been listed and an association has been formed to collect artefacts connected with the trade and create a small museum. The Historic Gardens Foundation has closer links with France than with any other country, but its remit is European, indeed worldwide. So let me end with a brief look at a park in Denmark, Lerkenborg. Here, the owner sold part of his estate for development. The loss of the land did not in itself diminish the historic park, but alas, a power station was built on what was sold, and it now looks as though the historic landscape is suffering from the emissions. I could show you examples of this sort of stupidity from countries all over Europe. Happily, they're becoming less frequent, but we must not be complacent. The Historic Gardens Foundation will campaign for gardens to be saved and for laws to help or protect gardens properly. And when they are saved, we'll make sure that the whole world knows about it. The HGF is completely independent. We receive no subsidy or funding from any company or government or other institution. We have just over 300 members in 23 countries, and we desperately need to double that number by the end of the year. So if you own a historic garden or work in one or plan to make a career specialising in some aspect of historic gardens, or even if you just like visiting these marvellous and fascinating places, then please support our work by joining the Foundation. Thank you very much. Well, we've got a little time for all the fill-out Any questions?
questions? Any questions for Jason? How many members do you have now? Um, about 300. In about 23 countries. You showed us a picture of Kerbalo. Yes. Is that in trouble? I, I don't quite know what has happened. Uh, um, there were, in the, um, uh, Prince Peter Volkonsky died, I think, last year. And before his death, there were enormous disputes between him and his daughter, or rather his son-in-law. And um, I've been, there. he set up an association um, in his lifetime. And I understand that some means has been found of, of keeping it going but I don't know the exact details or what the involvement of his daughter is in it. But I hope it's been saved because it's wonderful, but very labour-intensive. And Le Colombia, too, is a dreadful tragedy. I saw it five years ago, I suppose. It was groggy then, but to say an English lady who doesn't care she says she's going to restore the house and garden, but she's not very interested. She says she's bought it as a private family home, and um, she really doesn't see why anybody else should be the least bit interested in what she does with it. it it's, a, it's a point of view. I think it's rather sad. I think she could have bought hundreds of other vill villas on the Riviera um, to have a, a family home and, and an unimportant garden. Um, but she's bought this, and I'm very glad somebody's bought it, because there were horrific problems to succession there. There were something like 12 heirs, including one of whom was a, an illegitimate child in Germany, and they had to go and find her, and, and the complications were enormous. So they did, in the end, manage to sell it, which is good. And um, it, at least it's being maintained at the moment. And this is the sort of thing you are campaigning for, it's bringing it to everybody's attention. We will bring that sort of garden to people's attention. We try not to lean on people too hard. I would rather make a big fuss about Le Coudre Montpensier than about a private garden, because I think that is a, a, an absolute scandal. Um, but um, we, we will campaign. What we like more to think of ourselves as doing is just sharing information that if people have restored their garden, they want other people to know about how they did it, the, the problems they had doing it. Um, whether with Ladrac or with English heritage, the, the way they solved the problem. We want to encourage people to do proper research. Um, in France, they are learning to about archaeology, which Brian will tell you about tomorrow. Um, but there is a tendency, one of my campaigns is to allow French owners, persuade French owners, to allow access by historians to their archives, because they just won't. They regard them as private family papers and they don't want a, an outsider to find out what Uncle Francois Xavier was up to in the 1890s. And again, I have sympathy with that, but I would like to persuade them that a reputable historian is not going to talk about the uncle's peccadilloes. He's going to, um, or she is going to look into the history and can find things about the garden that the owner doesn't know about. So often an owner says to me, I know exactly how to restore our garden because there's an 18th century plan hanging up in the hall. And I have to say, unfortunately, madame, that is not enough. The 18th century plan may never have been made. It may not have been made exactly as it is in the plan, even if it was made. It may have been changed later and changed for the better because it didn't work. Um, it, it's not enough just to say we've got the plan. Let's find the money to re redo that plan, to recreate that plan. The, the serious research has to be done. And we, we want to make it seem a pleasure to them, um, either to let somebody else do the serious research for them or to go burying in their own, burrowing in their own archives or in the departmental archives themselves. No, you, you can phone him up and he still won't do anything. He's gone, he has been talked to, poor man, by so many people and nagged and bullied that he's gone into a sort of hermit crab shape and he won't talk about it to anybody um, and he won't let people in. And he's got a particular problem there because um, it was created as a, um, as a spring garden. The Vicomte only went there in the spring and all the marvellous plants were going to 
flower in the spring. By the summer, it was too hot. In the winter, he could afford to go somewhere else. It was a spring garden, so he has a particular problem. If he's going to open it to tourists, um, tourists actually expect lots of flowers all year round. You, he will have to have a fairly sophisticated level of visitor if it's only open in the spring um, and not in the summer. And if he, if he does restore it and puts the spring flowers back that were originally there. It went up to the um, uh, famous peony, um, beds and beds of peonies, and that was the end of it. When, as they began to fade, he moved. And um, it, it is a particularly interesting problem of restoration um, when it's got round to, and I hope it will be. But for the moment, I don't think anything can be done. Um, somebody else was... Yes, I'm just thinking about your Red Cross Oh, yes, because you were involved. <laughs> They're, they're applying for a lottery grant, and um, I'm not involved anymore. The, the National Trust moved in the, the heavy ammunition, and um, that, that was rather it. So far as the local people who've done, as you know, the local people there did all the work to start with, to get it going. And the National Trust just kept saying, no, 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 we don't want to be involved. And um, suddenly they realized they were sitting on this little urban gem and they want to have an interest at the moment in urban gardens. They want to change their image of just being large country house gardens. And they, they were desperate. They suddenly thought, we've got an urban garden that we can take an interest in. And that was it. They're now taking an interest. They are helping prepare the lottery plan. Um, and I hope it will be successful. I, I don't know the present state of it. But they do hope to do absolutely everything, the bandstand, and it will be very good because everyone said, if you restore the bandstand and the pond and all these things, will it be vandalised, in, particularly in that area? And the decision has been taken that, by and large, properly restored gardens are not vandalised. Children respect them, particularly if you can get the school in. And I know that what happened, Brian, you went to the school, didn't you? We, we couldn't get the school children, there's a school opposite, we couldn't get the school teachers interested. Oh, and right. Brian went to do the archaeology in that garden. Go on, t tell well, them. Well, I, I basically found the remains of the, the bandstand and the pond and the paths and the trees and everything that they were doing. Oh, sort of that far all, down. All these So there is a groundswell of, of, of interest and it's very important to sort of be picking up and captivating this, the, the interest of these primary school children because they are, for all, are going to be the people that we're going to be looking to the future to, sort of, to take responsibility for the conservation. Uh, absolutely, yes. And also they're the people who at the moment will be vandalising it if they're not in sympathy with it. So bringing in the, the, the younger generation, even very, very young children, is very important. And there's a movement in this country called um, uh, Learning Through Landscape, which works with, particularly with inner city children in, to restore gardens. And in France, there's what's it called, Adopter un Jardin, um, which aims to do something of the same, same sort, and it's very important. Anybody else? Is there no uh, nothing that can compel the city of Paris Look after, is it more policy? Yes. Well, is there no legislation that is positive in that way? Is it a listed or? Yes, is that the chateau is inscrit, or it may be classic, and it should, in theory, the whole garden should be subject to the 500 um, metres perimeter law, so that it should be protected under that, if yeah. under nothing else. Um, France. That's against things, not compelling people to. No, it should, it, no, no, it should protect it a bit more firmly. I mean, it should, it's been subject to vandalism and all sorts of things, and it should at least protect it against that. Um, France works differently from England, as I've had to learn when I work over there. And um, in England, you, one, we look at the law and try to implement it, whether it's good or not, and two, we sort of filter up the scales of talking to people. In France, you go in at the top and try and do someone at the top and unfortunately, the person who was involved at the top when we all started this was the mayor of Paris, Jacques Chirac. And we're, he has handed it over to Monsieur Tiberi as a problem. And the whole affair is blocked for the political reasons which the French here will know about. And we cannot persuade people lower down in the ministries and that to take an interest 
because of this concentration of power at the very top that was originally involved in the ownership. We couldn't actually originally even get the city of Paris to admit that they owned that garden. They <laughs> it seems extraordinary. So, there we are. Well, thank you all very much indeed. And there's a copy of the magazine. I don't know where the box has got to. There's a box of magazines and some leaflets. Oh, thank you, Alex. Excellent. Is it now lunch? Is this well, um, I mean, like we have say? slight changes um, with, with our timetable. And uh, Mr. Carvalho is supposed to be here at 1.30. I talked to him yesterday. Um, he said um, it would be better to make it 2 o'clock. Um, so let's be better. Uh, well, should be back here at two o'clock. So um, to give him enough time to. Or would it be sensible if Monsieur and Madame de Gandhi are prepared to go? That's another possibility. After lunch, would you be prepared to go at one thirty? Why not? And we just sort of. Well, I think that would be very happy. One thirty. One thirty. Yeah. Do you want me to phone home and see if Molly's arrived? Um, what well, a good idea. Yeah, well, he's, he said he will leave a message at reception. Yeah, I think we could accept. But, I mean, why don't we do that right now so he can calm down and get a rest and we'll start with you at 1.30. Um, I get the magazines out. Thank you very much, guys. So, like that, certainly in the near situation of the English people, but Corons is one of the most beautiful gardens in the whole world, not just France, but anything. And so, you've still got some time to go, most of you, but don't linger, because it is very, very special. And also, do buy the book that has already been mentioned, The Gardens of France by Ernest de Gandhi. It was the first book on historic gardens I ever bought. Was for rebound today by Rosemary Vieri, so it comes with very good compliments. You won't get that bit of it, but you can sometimes still find it in second hand bookshops. So now your treat must be done. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. It's exactly the contrary of an understatement, and uh, I think uh, you've been over flattering. Well, I hope the photographs will show you will give you an idea of what goes on in Gouance, or what it looks like. But I think it would be a good idea if I went back a little bit on the story of Gouance itself. Uh, there's always been a chateau and a park in Gouance, and uh, the, the first uh, things one knows about it is uh, uh, an engraving uh, dated back to 17-something, uh, which is uh, the plan of the house, which you see here, the front wall, uh, alongside the moats, have disappeared, but the general idea of the park, completely different today, gives you more or less the layout as it is. The park itself is about uh, 150 acres, and uh, uh, that is uh, uh, the second photograph showing the plan of the park, which is, uh, uh, unfortunately, it's not dated. But we think it's, uh, it's how it looked and it's very much uh, what it is today or what has it been redone in the places it had been changed. Uh, the, 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 the first part of my uh, expose is to tell you that uh, in Courants we have uh, the story of Courants itself throughout the years. Um, since those days, the revolution passed, and the, the, the Nikolai family, who was owner of the place, uh, were guillotined, father and two sons, during the terror in 1793. And the, the, the widow, uh, Courant belonged to her in her own right, and the widow was also given back Courant that had been taken away for a while, and stayed there till 1830. At that time, there was a family drama, and uh, the, the, uh, the, the, that lady and her children left overnight, uh, never to return. And uh, the place stayed as it was. The, 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 the dining room table had not been cleared, and it really left in a hell of a hurry. 
And the place stayed like that for 70 years. I don't think it was in a very good state. 40 years. And <laughs> it's, in this, it's indispensable to have a wife to, <laughs> to put things back on, on rail. But as it were, the place uh, uh, was, in, was neglected. And as you know, if, uh, two years uh, of neglected is appalling. 40 years, there's nothing much left about it. And uh, so everything decayed. The, 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 the house more or less collapsed. There was a tree growing in the dining room. And uh, uh, the people, it had become a kind of lieu de visite for painters of the Ecole de Barbizon, who went by there, including the painter Sicily. And he wrote about it. Uh, we went to Courant to see that lovely place uh, melting like a piece of sugar in, in a saucer which showed how bad it was, the state was it. The, pla the place was sold and bought by my great-grandfather in 1872, the Baron de Habert. And uh, that was the beginning of the restoration uh, of Coins. The, the, as far as the park is concerned, it was thought that Monsieur Le Nôtre you know the famous uh, Louis XIV gardener, the author of Vaux in Versailles, uh, had worked on it, but there's no proof of that. Uh, nevertheless, uh, it must have been a slightly good uh, landscape decorator or gardener who used all the possibilities given by the, we've got lots of springs in Courant, and fresh water gushes out in about 12 different places, uh, places in, in the park and are cleverly used. So they, 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 one pièce d'eau floats into the, flows into the next one, and there's no mechanism or no machinery. It's just natural gravity that brings down all the rivers, all the, so, uh, the sources, uh, the springs, from the top part of the, of the, uh, the plan, down uh, from, north, uh, from top to bottom into the river that flows at the bottom of the park. So that's uh, the, the only design we have or plan of the old, uh, the old thing. Um, so a, I told you about the weeds growing uh, uh, and uh, the place falling to pieces. And then uh, uh, my great grandfather uh, thought of calling Monsieur Duchesne, which was mentioned a number of times this morning, which was a great uh, a la mode uh, garden uh, designer or redesigner and who worked at Courants, among many other places, and did a considerable job. Uh, Monsieur Détailleur, who was an architect, worked on the house, and, and both together, uh, the, the, the park was remade, more or less as it was, except for one pond, which I think is here. You see the chateau in the background, and, and, the, the, and, and the, 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 the pond in the first place, in the first uh, level, is à l'anglaise. And that was a kind of a, uh, 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 there was a big square pond that, that had been destroyed and remplacé. Instead, they put that uh, English touch in it, uh, which was uh, uh, dismantled a bit later when they thought they'd restore Courants to what it looked like on, on, on the first plan I showed you a minute ago. As far as the house itself, it had been... Uh, those are different aspects of the park in those days. Those photographs are about 1888, and uh, the, the uh, postcards are very sepia-colored photos but they show you the kind of upkeep and extravagance. You see the flowers at the foot of the statues and the, the fountain there on the first level has been moved a number of times and you'll see it a bit later in another place. This is what the house looked like. Uh, uh, the, 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 the terrace has been put in by Monsieur de Tailleur, the tall finish, chimneys too, and uh, 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 that was the, the taste of uh, as far as the chateau is concerned, uh, of being a little bit extravagant. 
and uh, we thought it was a mistake. Uh, nevertheless, it, had, it was there and was considered then a great success, and uh, 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 it was lived in a, in a grand style. This is a view of the far side of the house in winter, which is rather amusing because winter don't happen more. Uh, but you see all kinds of little details, the, 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 the statues are on the side and the vases along the, 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 the pond. This was another example of a, a, a rather extravagant topiary, and the pond just behind is a square pond that had been returned to what its original shape uh, that we saw on the plan and had been turned into an English type of landscape before. So that was a, a more or less uh, in the 1900. This was a different aspects of the park, you see. Uh, 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 this pond is called the Nap, and it's a diff it's uh, different levels <coughs> of, of water flowing uh, from one spot to the other, and on both sides you've got paths, uh, rake paths going right up to where there's a, there's a, there's a, a gate. That's a view of the uh, the, uh, of the arrival, which is uh, very whitish. Uh, it had been uh, over scrubbed, I'm afraid, and <laughs> now it has resumed a color which we'll see in color in a minute, which is rather uh, uh, nicer than uh, uh, that thing that looks, uh, when it was first made, probably like a lump of sugar. This is another uh, part of the park called the Grand Canal, with uh, a, a path very, com very complicated to keep. And, uh, uh, and bordered by trees uh, and, uh, and no hedges. <coughs> this is the view from the house. It's rather complex. Uh, uh, not, you see the statues have been moved back from the side of the main pond, the miroir, and uh, uh, I insist on the, the, the number of paths running around it. You see a kind of road along the statues and uh, uh, that has become important when they all disappeared, and we'll talk about that in a minute. This is another view of a sophisticated garden in the face of the 1900, uh, uh, gone for good. This is the view from the house towards the entry, and uh, uh, the, 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 the tall trees on each side are plain trees, and uh, outside, the, the wide gate in the fo uh, far away, you see the, the countryside, and now trees have been planted uh, over there, and they're now about 60 years old, and it looks much less barren. This is another view of the same pond with a little uh, uh, um, cascade taken from the other end. And this is a view from the chateau showing the path and uh, the, 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 the grass which is reasonably kept and the, the, the tall trees inside the, 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 the banister were trees that had been always there to hide what was in the old days the farm that touched the main house. And the farm was destroyed and instead of that they put in a, a modern uh, stone building which uh, then got the trees were there to hide it a bit because it, it looked rather, uh, rather uh, useless. Another photograph of the big pond, the miroir. Another one. This was uh, the, the later on, this was about 1930s, uh, alongside the so south part of the house and a little secluded garden uh, rather, uh, that has difficult to uh, keep up and uh, it's been replaced by something far simpler. And there you have the photograph of Courant as it looked in 1940, just before the war, in 1939. Uh, the the, the, the Pierre work is different. The little Altea are, are uh, stand alone in the little uh, rings 
uh, there's a little path running around the big pond, looking like a like a um, like a, um, a car, a thing, to the place, just to make it a bit more complicated to upkeep. <laughs> So uh, that, uh, that has brought me to 1940. Uh, until those years, uh, two, two um, epochs, I want to remind, but between 1890, when the place was more or less fixed, and 1914, there was a great uh, luxury in Rouen, uh, kitchen gardens, uh, gardeners, flowers, uh, uh, they say in the hot houses or even cold houses, uh, um, and, and uh, lots and lots of, of gardeners doing by hand what is done today uh, by machine. The place was very well kept, and the parties were great, and they were shooting in the winter the pheasants and partridges, and that uh, finished with the 1914-18 the, the, the war. Then the, uh, everybody helping on the place was called up in the army. The, the chateau was turned into a hospital by my grandmother. And, uh, uh, and after the war, things ha had changed considerably. Uh, in income tax had been invented, and, uh, uh, and, and things were very different. So the hothouses were rather cooler. Uh, there were less pheasants. Uh, the begonias were gone. And, uh, but nevertheless, it was a very splendid uh, time between uh, the 1920 and 1939. Not a very long time uh, uh, before more trouble happened to go on. In, uh, uh, in 1935, uh, uh, my grandmother, who thought all oh, this was uh, very splendid and very formal, yeah wanted something more fun in a, pay in a corner where it wouldn't be in, in the view, but to have a bit of fantasy. So she built a, a, a garden which we call pompously, a, 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 a Japanese garden, and she was helped for that uh, by Miss Lloyd Jones, who was a great uh, English gardener, very a la mode in those years. And, uh, but my wife was to do more about the Japanese garden than I can. So I think that is, uh, we've reached the place where uh, the, the war starts. Uh, my grandmother died in 1940, and uh, when we came back from the cemetery, you know, uh, France was occupied from, the, from the, uh, uh, September 1940 onward, and when we came back to the house, there were two German officers in the lobby, uh, with the paper, and they said they were requisitioning the house, the park, the stables, everything, and you are going to have uh, four rooms or five rooms out of the house, and we take the rest. That was a, 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 it was a bad blow, such a, certainly on that day, but uh, certainly I'm pleased my grandmother wasn't there to see it. And that was the beginning of se the second downfall of France, where the German army, it was the Luftwaffe, the ground forces, who took over, and there was a commandanture in the, in the house, and they started building barracks, garages, and all kinds of uh, uh, military equipment to house 2,000 people. Thank God, not on that part of the house, but on the one uh, on, on, on the side you come in by. And they built for about six months, and there were uh, two garages, uh, 300 meters long, and barracks, and, uh, and all that poor, uh, with concrete, acres of concrete. That lasted uh, until 43. In 1943, to add insult to injury, a bomb depot was put into the park, hidden by trees. I must say that all the barracks and the things built up by the Germans had one asset, if I may put it that way. They never touched one single tree using them as camouflage. So the trees that were there since years remained there. Not one single tree was hurt by that occupation. Uh, in those days, uh, the, the, the upkeep of the place during that occupation was hopeless. All the people who had been uh, soldiers, or most of them, were, had been taken prisoners. 
and were POW in Germany, so the place was unkept, except for a few girls doing what they could, old pensioners who did also what they could, but the, the result was uh, pretty uh, negative. And uh, as the years went by, the place became messier and messier, uh, more and more ugly to look at, uh, camouflaged, and, and uh, with uh, trucks rolling in and out. Except for us, we had to have an ausweise, a pass to go in and out, uh, let in or let out by a, a German sentry. It was a, it was a miserable time, and that lasted uh, until 1944. Uh, in 1943, uh, I was uh, in those days at the agricultural school of Grignon, near, uh, not very far from Versailles, where the horticultural school was. And uh, uh, having been in the resistance, I was flown out to England, joined the army, and didn't come back to 1946. So between 43 and 46, uh, uh, I wasn't there, so I don't quite know. I was told what was going on, what went on. And this is what it more is what happened. Oh, yeah, I see. Uh, in 40, when the Germans left, uh, when after D-Day and hope returned, uh, the Germans left and uh, took away uh, a certain number of pieces of furniture and blew up half the, the depot of bombs in the, in the park. But they, they had warned everybody that the explosion was going to happen. So people opened their windows, and uh, except for the panes that were smashed in a two mile radius, very few ho houses was, uh, was spoiled, except for the forest, where there was a, a 10 acres uh, flattened out the forest and a deep hole where the bomb had been. Then the Germans, uh, the Americans, came, the liberation came. Everybody was terribly happy. And, uh, uh, but the, 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 the garages, the huts, and all that was still there, unused. So the, the American army uh, came here, came to Guas, and uh, moved into those uh, buildings to turn Guas into a, an American a guardhouse for all the naughty boys of the American army. And um, uh, uh, we were very pleased to be liberated, but we would have preferred having uh, um, uh, ordinary Americans than rather the, the tough guys of the army. So the barbed wire went up all over the place. The tree trunks were painted white but to see people trying to escape at night and hiding behind trees so they could be recognized along the, 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 the white stuff. And that lasted for another two years. Uh, and uh, so then, for different re political reasons, the American army left uh, uh, France to go to Germany. And uh, uh, so the American, when they left, accidentally set off the other half of the bomb depot but that time was no, no warning, it was an accident. I think uh, 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 an American soldier was killed uh, uh, during the operation. He wanted to see what a bang looked like. And uh, the bang went off, and the roof went off, and uh, there was a tremendous amount of damage, once more within a two mile radius in the different villages surrounding Guas. Then, uh, 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 more to the, to the dismal situation of all that, the, 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 French, uh, the French authority called Les Domaine, uh, who run uh, public property, sold uh, at a, in an auction all that had been built by, 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 by the Germans and improved or modified by the Americans. Everything that was above ground, so the garages went, the huts went, and we were left just with the concrete. And uh, uh, when I commented, uh, uh, when I came home and I was able to talk to the people, I said, what about the concrete? Well, that you have a wonderful roller skate area, you shouldn't complain. It was an angle which I, well, wasn't exactly mine. So they we were faced with a place, unkept for six years, uh, acres of concrete, all the ponds full of uh, weeds, muck, whatever you can imagine, 
and uh, uh, it was rather a, a tough look ahead. All the paths had disappeared, and uh, the hedges hadn't been cut for, for, or clipped for years, and all that gravel in the middle was overgrown, and uh, uh, it looked pretty messy. And uh, uh, so the, we looked at the thing and we said, uh, what happens now? And it was decided that to try and save cross fill another time. So we went hard at it with small means. Um, I told you about the acres of concrete and devastating forest. 